G'day guys, it's so good to have you on the Elevate Online Experience. Here it is, week three of More Than Enough. It's an awesome message, so strap in for them. At Elevate, we love reaching and building into people just like you all over the planet. The ways you can be reminded that we're on every week is by subscribing to our channels, liking our channels, and sharing them with a family or a friend you reckon may be interested. The Belonging Co. is our awesome worship partner for this week. The words will be on the screen, so maybe join in from home.
came from glory, took on flesh to save the lost, grace and mercy, displayed upon the cross our redemption. He's the hope for all mankind, one name over everything, one name over everything. So here it is guys, this is actually the third and final week of a fantastic series. So buckle up because Mark Pomery is our message speaker today.
Well, hey there, Elevate family and friends. Great to have you with us today for, as Tom's already mentioned, the third and final week of the series we've called More Than Enough. And uh, through this series, through February, we've been coupling it with a generational opportunity that we're calling Building the Future. And Building the Future is all about an opportunity that we feel God's calling us to, to pioneer again. Now, for those of you joining us for the first time today, let me catch you up. And for the rest of you, if you've been on this journey already, let's go on a bit of a refresher. Uh, Elevate Church this year in 2024 is 74 years old and pioneering has been a consistent hallmark of Elevate Church through this entire 74 year period. Going all the way back to the beginning, where a group of people, we don't know their names individually, uh, they decided that children in their sphere needed to learn about Jesus. And they launched in 1950, the Wayside Sunday School, under a tree somewhere. And uh, I, we just love their spirit. We love the fact that they, they seemingly were like, we, we, don't, we have no budget, no building, but no problem. We are just going to use what we have, our faith, the word of God, and invest in this next generation. Just pioneering from scratch. Absolutely brilliant. And then we've seen various expressions of pioneering in the 1960s, in the 1970s, then in the 1980s. In the 1980s, uh, the church kind of went bonkers when it came to pioneering, and they purchased, uh, this is a footprint, they purchased uh, residential uh, houses next door. So for future expansion, they built our current auditorium to allow room for more people, to reach more people and build more people. That happened in the 1980s. And then in 2015, our current generation purchased another residential property on the other side. And so now, today, we are sitting on a 6,000 square meter rectangular footprint just minutes from the Perth CBD. It's a phenomenal resource and it provides us a phenomenal opportunity going in and pioneering the next phase of Elevate Church. But here's the thing, uh, we did borrow from the bank to buy this particular property in 2015. Uh, we purchased the property for just under a million dollars and today we owe the bank $700,000. So we've created some equity, which is always great, always powerful. Uh, we're paying the mortgage, you know, bare minimum, just making the payments, keeping the bank happy. But we really feel God's calling us to aggressively attack that $700,000 balance and really just move the needle uh, to see what God wants to then open up for us, the opportunities that that will then open up for us. Here's one of the things that uh, John, one of Jesus' hand-picked 12 disciples, it was kind of a dream, a revelation he had, where he heard a group referring to God as the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come, who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Now, all three of those things matter. The God who was, we look back at the faithfulness, the miracles, what God's done already, and, and, and we can take great encouragement and great inspiration from that, but we're not meant to merely look back and just celebrate the good old days. Another mistake we can make whilst we celebrate what God's doing in the present is to simply kind of settle and just reside in the present, the God who is. In only focusing on the God who was and or the God who is, we're going to miss the God who is yet to come. We're going to miss on the possibilities that he's calling us to the opportunities. We're going to miss the faithfulness that he wants to express in the current and the future generations, the, the, the opportunities he wants to set up for the future generations, the, the, the things that haven't yet been done, been seen, been accessed, been created by God's incredible, miracle-working power. 
So we're looking at the God who is. We've looked at the God who was. I encourage you to go back and, 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 and listen to last week's podcast. I'll come back to that in a second. Really aligning ourselves with the God who is yet to come. What's God calling us to do to position ourselves for the next generation to be able to stand on our shoulders, to see further and to go further? Because the winds of aggressively attacking this mortgage is ownership. You know, when you have more ownership in your resources, you have more say in what you can do with them. And the bank has less say in what you can and can't do with them. It's about creating opportunities. Like what would this look like with less debt and more alignment with the future? And then right now we're directing some of our regular giving to paying the mortgage. And we want to release those resources to be able to invest in ministry and simply dedicate our building the future giving to attacking this mortgage. So, this is this series, More Than Enough. And the big idea, and and the reason this is the big idea is because we don't want to attack this mortgage simply in our own strength, our own resources, our our own uh, current uh, position. No, we want to access the God who is more than enough, the God who can do more and immeasurably more than we can even ask for or imagine. And so the big idea of this series, More Than Enough, is to see us move from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. Because if we live in a scarcity mindset, people that live in a scarcity mindset live in constant fear that there won't be enough, that there's never been enough, that there's never going to be enough. Enough, and it's about self sufficiency. And if we live with self sufficiency, then that's finite, that's limited. Moving to an abundance mentality sees us moving from fear into faith, sees us moving from self reliance into God reliance. And, and, and what that requires is us actually having a growing understanding that we serve and are loved by a God who is more than enough. So what we've been doing is just a really quick flyover of two chapters that Paul uh, from a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Now, Paul was an early church leader. Uh, he wrote letters to the churches. This is one of the letters to the church in Corinth, which is in modern-day Greece. And we're just looking at two chapters where Paul exclusively, in these two chapters, wrote about the transformative power of generosity. So I cannot encourage you strongly enough. If you missed either of the first two weeks or you want to recap, either go back and watch them on this channel or I think better still, go and listen to the podcast because the podcast have some interview content which we didn't have here in our online experience. So you can go to our your favorite podcast app or platform, search Elevate Church Perth, and we'll be there and you can catch up. Okay, today we want to move into the second of these two chapters. So if you've got a smartphone camera, scan this flow code. It's going to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. While you're doing that, let me catch you up. The last two weeks we've been looking at chapter 8. Now we're just going to drop into chapter 9. So, This was Paul writing a letter to a church that he'd launched in the non-Jewish part of the world. And he was sent there by the early church leaders to talk about Jesus. Duh. And also they said, one more thing. Also teach them about the transformative power of generosity. And as best as we can determine, the reason they coupled that as a vital piece of the messaging is that we talked about this in week one of this series, God's greatest expression of love was giving. Jesus said it himself, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And that when we give, we are never more like God than when we give because love gives. And 
Seemingly, this church in Corinth, when they first received the message of Jesus and then received the message about the transformative power of generosity, evidently, they got into it. Evidently, they signed up. And, in, and evidently, they actually started giving. However, and, and, and to zoom out on this entire letter, it's primarily a letter of correction. Paul loved them so much that he didn't want to let them kind of get off course. And this particular two chapters was correcting them because whilst they had started living out their commitment to generosity, for some reason, and we don't know what the reason is, they stopped. So he wrote to them, to encourage them to get back on track and to ultimately become great at giving, to become great at living generously. And so he used the metaphor that, that this agricultural society would have been very familiar with. He wrote to them, remember this, because like they already know, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. He, he's not saying, uh, did you know this? No, he's saying, remember this. It's like, this is, this is, this is universal. You, you all already know this in the agricultural world. Well, this true, this uh, principle or this law actually rings true in the area of giving and generosity. Now, I understand this. Uh, I have an urban farm in our backyard, and uh, I grow things throughout the year, different seasons, different things. And uh, right now, it's summertime here in Perth, Western Australia. And uh, leading into the summertime, I, I get my you know, planting uh, schedule together, and we love tomatoes. So I go to a local store who sells beautiful, locally, uh, preserved heirloom tomato seeds in packets. And I buy several packets. I buy several packets because like, that's kind of the deal. And I want a variety of tomatoes. And then I put some of the seeds from each packet into pots in my greenhouse and eventually put them in the ground and eventually they grow. And voila, we have tomatoes. So right now in my urban farm, I have two categories of seeds from the packets that I purchased in the run-up to summer. One category of seeds are seeds that I put in the ground, planted them. The other category of seeds are the remaining seeds, the ones, and I probably will plant them next year, but right now, they're still sitting in the packet, sitting in my garden shed. Well, let me ask you a Captain Obvious question. Of the two categories of seeds, the ones that I planted and the ones that I've stored up in my shed, guess which ones are producing a crop? Oh yeah, I'm not gonna insult you by even answering that one. But Paul's using this metaphor to highlight and make a case for the reality that from God's perspective and in God's economy, money isn't simply something that we are called to hang on to, that we're called to store up for ourselves, that instead God calls us to sow, invest, plant money and produce a generous crop. And again, it's like, if you understand the agricultural metaphor, it's a no-brainer. I didn't buy the packets of tomato seeds to put them in a container into my shed. I bought them to put them into soil, put them into the ground to ultimately create a return, a generous crop. This is called the law of the harvest. And it's timeless. Not only does the law of the harvest point to the reality that only if you plant something will you get a return. Paul also highlights another reality of the law of the harvest. And that's to say that the 
proportion or the amount that you plant will have a direct correlation on the amount that you will harvest from that crop. So if it's me and my tomatoes, if I put one tomato plant in the ground, I might get 20 tomatoes, something like that. <coughs> but if I put 20 tomato plants in the ground, then you do the math. But the point is, the more I plant, the more I sow, the more I invest, the greater the harvest will be. Now, one of the aspects that we've been teaching through this series, and we've been teaching about it for years, is that the journey when it comes to generosity is just like the journey of any other aspect of our faith journey, our journey following Jesus. And that is that it's a journey. <laughs> and I'm on record through this series when it comes to moving from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset that, that I grew up with a scarcity mindset, that I entered my 20s, my, my first earning years with a scarcity mindset. I didn't know any different. But thankfully, as I came to read more of what God has to say about sowing, reaping, giving, generosity, abundance, his nature, his character, the fact that he's more than enough, that he's our provider, that he's the source, then I've just gone on this journey and I continue to go on this journey from an, a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. And we're just inviting you to join us on this journey. And it kind of looks something like this. Uh, there's a lot of ways you could characterize this. Let me just give a, a very simple framework uh, as we close out this series today. A lot of people maybe start with this notion that anything that comes our way financially, pay packet is the most uh, common example, of, that it's from me, you know, like I went to work, I earned this, and therefore it's for me. And, and we live in a culture where that's the prevailing mindset and the prevailing messaging. Interestingly, it also kind of plays to the reality that one of the first words that kids speak after mama, dada, or whichever one they get out first, before long, they're using the word mine, mine. And parents, you're like, where did they get that from? Because you know you didn't teach them that word. But it's almost like there's this innate kind of brokenness that's baked into us where we attempted to live selfishly and as if everything is from me and for me. But what we learn with Junior is if Junior's growing, Junior will start to learn to share. And ultimately, Junior will start to learn to be living generously but this might be a starting point and with no judgment at all that might be where you're at today and so again it's an invitation from God to come on this journey somewhere along that continuum is the realization that the first belongs to God that that he calls us to honor him with the first that the things that come our way might not be tomato seeds. They'll probably be a salary, a wage, an income. And it could be likely that it's you that went to work or ran the business or did the stuff to earn that money. But there's a, a growth and an awareness that, boy, uh, I want to honor God because God gave me this job. God gave me the skills. God gave me the opportunities. God blessed me with this business. And I want to make sure that I'm putting him first and honoring him first. And there's a lot of talk about how much that should be and whether it should be an amount or a percentage. We're more in the percentage game because everyone earns a different amount. So it's about equal portion, not equal amount. Um, and as best as we can determine, the, the long arc of God's word when it comes to giving points to the idea that the first 
is both a goal and a minimum. It's called a tithe. It's not a law. It's not a rule. It's not meant to be an onerous thing. It's just it's something that that we can actually aim for. So if you're at zero percent, then your next step might not be ten percent, but it might be one percent. Just take your first step. Maybe you've taken your first step and you're somewhere around maybe four percent. Well, try six. Try just it's a journey. Take next steps. And if you've already hit 10%, don't stop there. Like the same God who got you there grew your faith, showed himself faithful, demonstrated his provision that he's more than enough. He can just keep it going. You can take the trainer wheels off at that point and just keep going and move ultimately into this place of sacrificial giving where when it comes to your outgoings from your income, giving starts to move higher and higher on the list in terms of the amount that you're able to give. It's almost like you try to outgive God, which you never will, but it's like, it's fun trying. And this is an amazing, amazing, amazing place to ultimately hover around. But here's the thing. Once again, start somewhere or assess where you are and take the first step or the next step and just see what God does for you. The God who's more than enough does in you and the God who's more than enough does through you. And it's not about manipulation, it's not about guilt, it's not about some sort of fundraising campaign. In fact, Paul goes on to write this, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Now, when you read that last piece, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, it might be easy to conclude, you know, Paul's saying, you better give and you better like it, which is like, I don't think that's his angle here. In fact, the clue is right at the beginning. Decide in your heart. First of all, decide. Like, if you're waiting for an angel to turn up at the end of your bed and tell you to give, it might happen, but it probably won't. If you're just waiting for some washing over of emotion before you start to give, again, it might happen, but, but probably not. It's more about a decision. It's like, I'm going to get better at this. I'm going to become great at giving. That's actually my decision, so I'm going to take a next step. But in terms of the amount, in terms of the percentage, Paul says... Decide in your heart, not decide in your budget. I mean, look at your budget. But the clue is that actually, ultimately, what God's interested in isn't our giving. It's our heart. God wants us to give our entire heart to Him, to live with a heart that's fully surrendered to Him, to live with a heart that says, God have your way in me and have your way through me. I don't want to put any limits on you. And I want to live out of the overflow of your spirit working in my heart. And then Paul gives us another reminder of how it's possible to move from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. He writes to the church in Corinth, and this is true for us today, and God will <laughs> generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. God is the God of more than enough. For God's the one who provides seed from the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, He will provide an increase your resources, and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So here's the invitation as we're launching this generational opportunity to pioneer again. 
Go to our website, elevatechurch.me, scroll to the bottom, you'll see the contact us, and just say, hey, send me the information about pioneering again, about building the future. And we'll personally connect with you, give you the opportunity. In fact, we haven't actually set a numerical goal, like a financial goal, when it comes to building the future. The only goal we've set is 100% participation. The idea that each and every single one of us would say, count me in. And that together we'll see as a church united, arms linked, faith joined, marching forward, aggressively attacking this $700,000. Let's see the miracle working God, the God who is more than enough, do immeasurably more than we can even ask for or imagine. So as the message alluded to guys, at Elevate Church, giving is an important part of what we do. So if that's something that you may be interested in, the ways to give can be found just below. Until then guys, it's been an absolute pleasure having you this week and maybe we'll see you next week.